I'm an aeroplane And it's driving me insane With a brum 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 poo Contaminating you With my wings and my engines too Watch out cos I might have to crash on you I ain't just a gentle bleeding glider I'm a jumbo jet and my fuselage is so much wider <laughs> I'm an aeroplane and I ain't half out my brain With a brum 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 I'm gonna crash on you <laughs> With a brum 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 I'm going to crash on Hello, welcome to Gas Tank. My name's Rick Wakeman, and over there is Mr Tony Ashton. Well, people said that Ashton and myself deliberately picked people on this programme who were not averse to the old drop of the alcohol. But our next guest is no exception. Not only does he drink it, but he writes songs about it. In fact, one of the most famous ones that this gentleman wrote was Wide-Eyed and Legless. However, to get warmed up, because we're still sober at the moment, he's going to sing another track called Man Smart, Woman Smarter. Mr Andy Fair with a low.
really is quite astonishing that people always associate musicians with a certain background. You and I have a lot in common in as much as Otis Redding being my hero through all this early soul days. And we found out that we know a lot of the same people. I, I well remember the first time Otis Redding came, he didn't come to Cardiff, he came to Bristol. And I, I was born in Ustred Mac, but I spent <clears throat> all of my childhood in Cardiff. And Cardiff being a Bay Area at a very, very early age, and I mean a very early age, I was turned on to, whether it was ganja, marijuana, whatever, I was turned on by the black guys in the Bay to take fun of the white guy, you know, let's make sure that he really goes over the top, and they did. And uh, along with that went Brute Moe suits and Booker T. And I was weaned on Bo Booker T. I mean, I, I didn't listen to anything else that wasn't Booker T, that wasn't Stax, that wasn't Atlantic. You talked about the Memphis horns. I went over to Memphis and met, no, Duck Dunn. You talked to me about the Memphis Donald horns. Duck. Donald Duck. Yeah. Well, I, I got to first of all go back to the first time I met Otis Redding in Bristol. He came over with a 14-piece band. Did you meet him? Well, I got respect from Otis Redding written on the back of, like, a calling card, uh, which was a big deal, believe mm -hmm. me. But went at the back, and the band, the guitarist in the band was the guy that played with Joe Tex. They had a proper drummer, you know, and you class a proper drummer, like Tony, you know, mm -hmm. San Fernandez there. Hits his stick, crossed yeah. over like that. They had a proper drummer, a proper bass player, and all the people that came from Cardiff, and they, they did two shows. For the first show, there was practically nobody there. There were 50 people from Cardiff that took like three rows up at different intervals. Uh, and that was it. Out came uh, the Crying Shames, did their bit. Out came Zoot Money. And out came the band that backed out this red in. And they got this sax player with, the, with real, a mean looking jacket. Better, better than this one, I think. Yeah, I've taken mine off yeah. after seeing that. I'm not yeah. surprised. And the guy sort of holds his head down like that. And he goes, he got a saxophone in his mouth, believe me. Uh, and there's eight other guys at trombone, J.J. Johnson on trombone or whatever. And there's all of this section, and they play a song called Philly Dog. I mean, if you're old enough, you will remember this song. And there's two to three rows of people from Cardiff absolutely erupt in this place. And Otis Redding, Redding gave this performance that was incredible, like as if the place was full. Uh, a rare occasion. You have so heavily influenced by the, the, the real 60s soul of the Americans. Do you ever want to go there? Do you want to work there? Is that what you'd like to be? I, I went to America in 1974 and I eventually ended up working with two Irish guys, one guy from uh, Yorkshire, uh, and I did eventually work with an American drummer and ended up working with the Memphis mm. Horns, etc. I mean, America... It was great to arrive there off the plane from 39,000 feet. And you, you got there and I thought, I feel quite sick, which I did at the time. Mm -hmm. And I walk into my Japanese hotel and the hotel is being held up as I walk in. Some guy's robbing it and I'm nearly in tears because my, my physical being is at mm -hmm. a big all-time low. Uh, and I've, I, do get in, <laughs> I do get into my hotel room and a Japanese hotel has got a very... Funny arrangement for having a That's shower. San Francisco, is it? Yeah, Garnet very funny yeah. arrangement for having a shower or a bath. I yeah. eventually sat down on the floor on these tiles with the shower on top of me because I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do when I got in there. Oh, you went to dial eight and they send a young... Yeah, exactly. Right, for good. Uh, and they stepped on my back. Which, if I'd known they were going to step on my back, I'd have really enjoyed it. I'd just get quite confused, mm. you know. So, what do you really want to do? What are you up to now? Well, first of all, nobody really expects me to do whatever I do. Mm. I'm... You had a lot of things with The Who, you had some work. Oh, yeah. Which... It's most that. unlikely, the first Who album I ever got involved with was the one where Keith Moon died, just before he died. I got a phone call asking me if I'd come up and sing some vocals. And I thought at the time it was very peculiar that I'd get asked up to sing vocals. But apparently Pete Townsend's mother-in-law is a big fan. <clears throat> mm -hmm. of, you know, AFL, being me. And uh, <laughs> I got asked up to do the vocals. <clears throat> and I don't sing sort of proper harmonies. I arrived at the session and I, I, I sat there and I said, well, I, I will do a vocal, but uh, I'd really like to pick whatever note comes up, uh, as opposed to having to sing a proper note that was mm -hmm. written down. And uh, I said, well, we'll flip a coin. And we did flip a coin, and luckily enough, I won the flip of the coin. So I got to pick any note I wanted to pick, and everyone else went around it. And it was, it was a great mm. time. I was very pleased. I also knew that when the album came out, some guy was going to review it, saying, what in God's name is this guy, Andy Fairweatherlow, doing, singing mm. on a Who album? Uh, and he'd even freak much more if he knew that I'd play guitar on the new 
I play guitar on the new album. If they're coming for me, I'm not here. You can't hear it. Just out, of, just out of interest, I mean, you haven't stopped working since, since day one. What's up for you for 83? 83 is hopefully a new album. I've mm -hmm. sent my tapes to, uh, to Warner Brothers in America, mm -hmm. which I recorded uh, with Glyn Johns, who gave me his studio for nothing, mm -hmm. and the use of Glyn Johns as well. Uh, plus some very good friends of mine from Wales. I, mm -hmm. I honestly believe that Wales has a very strong centre of very important musicians. I'll tell you what, Andy, when we come up for the end of the series, when the album's out, come on and do a couple of tracks from and bring your friends from Wales. I Thanks very good much. Musicians, I Gentlemen and the scholar. As you've most probably noticed, quite a few friends of ours, musician friends that is, pop in to drink some wine and drink some more wine and occasionally play, which is very useful on this next track, which is Wide Eyed and Legless, which we promised you before from Andy Fairweather Low. This is Kevin Godley and Lowell Cream. years people have been trying to get uh, Kevin and Lowell to play together. Uh, for some unknown reason we've just about managed to succeed. Why has it been six and a half years? <laughs> Why? Well we've been busy doing other things. Such as? Such as uh, trying to get our foot in the door of films and we've been doing videos for ourselves and other people. We did a recording project but really our reason for getting out of the thing was, was to indulge our fantasies in other areas. The videos have been very successful. Do you find that some of the artists that you get to do videos for, you, you'd like actually to get on playing and produce the actual music yourself, or what? No, I don't think we do. I don't think we've ever had a case of um, actually wanting to get in there and play or help the music out. I mean, we like to come up with a thing fresh, and we don't always like the tracks we do the videos for, but that isn't the basis on which we'll do a video. It's, if there's something in the music or in the character of the, of the act that we, we can get off on, uh, and we can brings an idea to mind, then we'll do it. It doesn't matter whether we like it too much, as long as there's something there that we can actually pick up on and find a potential and that we can get an idea out of ourselves. We're a bit selfish in that <clears throat> the basis for a video is if we can make a good film for ourselves. Have you done your own video at all? Yeah, we've done all our own videos since... Yeah, but you're uh, pleased with them, your own, what you do yourself? Yes, at the time, I mean, we've, we've, we've sort of progressed, I think, since we started, and the, the first video we ever did was for our own track called An Englishman in New York. 
Mm -hmm. But sort of looking back on it now, although the idea was good, it could have been shot so much better. What do you think could have been shot better? It could have been shot better, it could have been edited better. There's certain shots of us sort of leaning over drums going... <laughs> and, you know, really naff things like that. And you would have tightened that up? Yeah. You would have removed it. It was it our if first time in the studio. We were learning all about the equipment. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, we're still there. Every time you go into a studio, you're learning something else. Um, Particularly today. Yeah. <laughs> when you came down, we had this sort of mad rehearsal sort of area time. And we, we collared you to play. I know, it was very embarrassing. Um, I felt very on the spot. Well, it was sensational, actually. It was great, because with Andy Fairweather down, it was, it was, like, really nice. And then we worked on... We, we sort of said to you, pick a piece, anybody's piece, to sort of play. Yeah. And we somehow ended up with, with Midnight Hour. Yeah. I mean, I don't know quite who... forced Andy to sing. That's right, forced Andy to sing. How did that... I mean, I did, you, like... did you ever... In, going, this is going back into the 60s when we were all like, in, extremely young. Uh, did you ever play Midnight Hour back in those... Did you ever do oh, all yeah. those sort of... All oh, the soul yeah. stuff? Kevin did. Yeah, I was in R&B. <laughs> An R&B band, way, way, way back. We used yeah. to play Ice Palaces and Bar Mitzvahs and mm. uh, parties. And we used to play all that old soul stuff. And yeah. Maybe, you know, some pretty obscure soul stuff as well. It's funny. It's, it's nice to play. We've... We're just about to complete a new album. Yes, all we needed are the words and the music. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, are, are you going to tour for the people who... I mean, for example, the, the success no. of the last single. No. When you, I mean, are you, do you ever intend touring again or doing so. live dates? We've got... No. no. We've or got, we got the Salt exclusive? You've got it. That's us playing live. All to, explain <laughs> one, all to explain one thing. When I said, what does everybody want to play? It's Lordship here. He's told me to call him his Lordship. He wanted to play reggae. Yes. Is that true? You wanted to play on a reggae number? Yes. yes. <laughs> Lowell wanted to play Midnight Hour. So we ended up doing half of Midnight <laughs> Hour. Is this true? And we stuck a bit of reggae in the and middle. And stuck a bit of reggae in the middle. Yeah, that's initiative, isn't it? Listen, it's bloody miracle.
between Jews. One of my heroes, a star called Ronnie Scott OBE. He used to employ him. This song about his various, his couple of clubs, one in Gerald Street, one in Fred Street. This earth. She put me on the line. She pushed me through the fifties. And I'm grateful for that time. And the atmosphere. Generous. And life was very neat. As I remember it. is down on Gerard Push me on some what? And then Pubescence came around, whatever that was. She pushed me hard with no retard when I heard that rock and roll sound. There was that Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, and Little Richard's beat. But I always found my help right down about this time, old Fred Street. It's the kind of Fritz Street on the right. Oh, Fritz Street. Oh, Fritz Street. Guaranteed to make you feel. With one foot in that grave And I was only born in 1946 Apparently I'm too old to rave I'm frowned on by the new wave And the rock and roll elite but I always take my refuse down at Uncle Ronnie's and Old Fritz. on the right. Old Fritz Street, Old Fritz Street, guaranteed to make you feel all right. Guaranteed to make you feel all right. Oh dear. Take a drink. Have a job. A bit, oh, cheers. It's the first time anybody's written anything for you, isn't uh, it? Uh, in music, yeah. I think it is. <laughs> yeah. Great compliment. 
really. Except uh, there was talk of Shostakovich writing a piano concerto for me. <laughs> but then uh, he discovered I never played the piano, so... It's just as well, because I wouldn't fancy playing the part. <laughs> Yeah. How, how does how does our band compare to the quintet? Is it oh well, it's a different thing entirely, you know. When compare the two, it's it's fun. They're both fun, but the quintet. You, you tune up, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we tune when I bought. But we have a lot, a lot of fun. The old guys are the best. Um, we have a lot of fun with the quintet. It's the best small band I think that I've ever worked with. You know, it's a marvelous trumpet player. Yeah. Uh, called Dick Pierce who um, comes from Stratford in London. Very poor family. They couldn't even afford tinsel for the Christmas tree. They used to have to wait for their grandfather to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then there's um, John Christensen on the piano, who's great, you know. He really is a, a nice guy, a good player. The drummer is, uh, is Martin Drew. And he comes from, uh, where did he come from? Northampton. That's a wonderful town. <laughs> If you're a leper, <laughs> <laughs> um, I come from the East End. Oh, I come from the East End of London. I'm a true Cockney, actually, born with the sound of boat bells and everything. Proud of it. And uh, also a very poor family. My father was always out of work down there in the East End. He was a shepherd. <laughs> uh, I learned about sex when I was a kid uh, in the East End by watching dogs in the street. You know. And one thing, one thing I've always remembered, you never let go of the girl's leg. Did you know that? Bless <laughs> uh, you, always. Oh, and then we've got Ron Matthewson on the bass, who comes from uh, uh, the Shetland Islands, which is a, a marvellous place to come from. <laughs> we, we, we spent a, a marvellous fortnight up there one Sunday, I remember. We had this job playing up in the Shetlands. When we got there, they were closed. But, uh, i tell you how quiet it is up there. The local call girl was a virgin. I don't get much quieter than that. <laughs> Listen, in between, in between oh, telling the eggs at the club and managing to get the tenor in your mouth occasionally, uh, is there any like, real famous guests that you really were proud to have at the club that you enjoyed more than any others? Um, it includes the old places. Yeah. Well. yeah well, well, I've enjoyed most of them. I mean, most of the the great jazz musicians have played there, but uh, occasions that stick in my mind are, are Sonny Rollins when he was there, because he's just fantastic. And Roland Kirk was also a, a marvellous guy. There was one night when we were raided, you know, I mean, the, the, uh, we didn't have the proper licence at that time, and Roland was playing at the, at the club, and we only had a licence to admit members and stuff like that, and we couldn't run that way, so we just ignored it. And Roland used to play on it, a, a number called the Penny Whistle Man, which involved him distributing about a hundred penny whistles to members of the audience, you know, and at a given signal from him, they'd all blow. And uh, he was in the middle of this, of this number, and there were a hundred penny whistles going. I mean, the noise was incredible, like a, a zoo on fire. And just at that time, <laughs> the police uh, chose that moment to raid us, you know, and about 30 plainclothes policemen and police women came into the club and started taking names and addresses of, of people who were drinking, you know, to ascertain whether, whether or not they were members. And, I mean, if people didn't, you know, give a shit. They just blew penny whistles in the police in the faces <laughs> of the policemen. And, I mean, and the cacophony. I mean, it was just like a, a maniac aviary, you know. And uh, um, one of the guys, our superintendent, come over, came over to me and said, um, tell him to stop about Roland. I said, no, you tell him. You know, <laughs> Roland, uh, being blind, didn't know what was happening, so just carried on playing, you know, and it was absolute chaos for about 20 minutes. I mean, I can laugh about it now, it wasn't too funny then. What do you think about all this? Um, and Rick, and what I'm doing, because I work for you. It's right. great to have you working for me. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you pay me more than I pay you. <laughs> um, well, right, I mean... That's... Well, I, you know, there's a lot of music I, I like uh, uh, that's going on today. I mean, I, I consider that uh, a great deal of rock and roll is... Well, nearly all, all of it really is based on the blues in the same way as jazz is. And uh, there are good rock and roll bands and um, not so good rock and roll bands, in the same way there is in, as there is in jazz. I do think that rock and roll owes a great deal to, to jazz musicians, you know, it's not something that hasn't really been uh, uh, fully acknowledged. But it's getting round to that, I think. And um, 
And then I like the kind of uh, easier things like um, the tune that the Andy uh, Fairweather low yeah, wrote yeah. is a pretty tune. I like that very much. And I listen to um, to classical music. I, I love uh, a Ravel and Chopin and Debussy and uh, and Puccini. I love Puccini. Because you've had you've had some like rock and, virtual rock and roll acts down the club, haven't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah. We had uh, a group called War. Mm -hmm. I think with Eric Burden. And uh, as a matter of fact, when, when Eric Burden was there with war, uh, Jimi Hendrix came in and sat in one night, and that was his, his last, really his last public appearance. He, well, he right, died, I mean, worked for you in that club. I, I, I can, sorry, I know this. <laughs> Don't you wish sometimes lesson. you could have had a tape recorder running? Oh, marvellous. Yes. I mean, several occasions when I'd have loved a tape recorder. I mean, that was one of them. Mm. And there was another time when Ben Webster and Coleman Hawkins, you know, two great classic tenor saxophone players, were in the club and um, and they uh, were talking about old times and uh, I'd, give, uh, I'd have given anything for a tape record. I mean, Ben Webster was such a marvellous character. I mean, talk about Jekyll and Hyde. He used to drink a great deal, Ben. Uh, but I will say this, when he worked at the club, he, he stayed 99% of the time sober, you know. But uh, when he wasn't working, he'd come down very, very drunk. And he came down one night to hear Coleman Hawkins, and he was very drunk. And you can always, you could always tell when Ben was drunk because he had the tie with the painted lady on it, you know, which was open, and a hat and, and the shirt open at the neck, you know. And and Billy Eckstein came into the club uh, uh, that night, and they hadn't seen each other for years, and they fell on each other, and they rolled on the floor and cuddled each other, and spent the whole night drinking at the bar and talking about old times. And then uh, about three days later, Ben came down the club again, you know, and I said, hello, Ben, it must have been nice to see Billy Eckstein after all this time. And Ben said, Billy Eckstein? I haven't seen Billy Eckstein for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> just, fi just, fin going, just finally, going. is there any one person, if you had to name one person that you've never had at the club who you would like there? Just the one person. Oh, oh you mean who's alive now? Well, I mean, dig <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to dig them up for you, I mean, <laughs> one person. It smells well, it Well, you know, there's very few people that haven't worked at the club. I think perhaps I'd like to have uh, Miles there with the band. That would but be we'll nice. have a word with him for you. Please do. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the programme. Okay. You're a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, Ron. Cheers. I'll do that again. Bless you, mate. Well, your hand's been ashed to...
Blackpool Evening Gazette. Tony Ashton, 83 St. Leonard's Road, Martin Blackpool, was gaily twisting away. The chubby checkers number one hit, let's twist again like we did last summer. And suddenly, Tony dislocated his patella. Underneath it said, can the twist kill? So I thought I'd write a song about it, which is called Blackpool's First Twist Victim. And we're fortunate enough to have Maggie Bell to help me out on it. And there she is.
so crazy. I'm so crazy. I'm so crazy. I'm so crazy. For more than you.